presenting the best for comedy. In this video, I will answer what was meant by the praise given to Edward de Vere in Francis Muir's Pallidus Tamia, published in 1598. He says, the best for comedy amongst us is Edward, Earl of Oxford. Quite simply, I believe it is a response to Sir Philip Sidney's critique of contemporary plays in his posthumously published Apology for Poetry, published in 1595. De uh, Sidney rather says, all their plays be neither right tragedies nor right comedies, mingling kings and clowns, not because the matter so carrieth it, but thrust in clowns by head and shoulders to play a part in majestical matters, with neither decency nor discretion, so as neither the admiration and commiseration, nor the right sportliness, is by their mongrel tragedy comedy obtained. Neither right tragedies nor right comedies is the key to understanding what Mears was saying, and also what Sir Philip was saying. Sidney continues, So falleth it out that, having indeed no right comedy, in that comical part of our tragedy we have nothing but scurrility unworthy of any chaste ears, or some extreme show of doltishness, indeed fit to lift up a loud laughter and nothing else, where the whole tract of a comedy should be full of delight, as the tragedy should be still maintained in a well-raised admiration. He also adds, proper aim of comedy to afford delightful teaching, not coarse amusement. I believe that Mears used the term comedy as a way to refute Sidney's rigid Aristotelian classification of plays. Sidney, he was also mocking the classification of plays. Sidney was railing against the disruption of the Aristotelian unities, whereby tragedy was reserved for the aristocracy, comedy was reserved for the middle classes, and pastoral plays were assigned to laborers who work with their hands. Mir's use of the term is a defense of the mingling of low comedy with high tragedy as a way to more accurately reflect life's randomness. It also places social classes on an equal footing within the context of the play and also emotionally. This is why some scholars say Shakespeare was prefiguring democratic principles, yet they are wrong. The plays show an aristocratic bias and disdain for those below the rank of noble. Close reading of the plays, or even a cursory reading, will show you that all of the commoner characters have names like Dogberry and Bottom and Snout. Hardly respectful, is it? I call works of fiction that have a mixture of comedy with tragedy, slice of life works. Aristotle and Sir Philip Sidney categorized drama neatly into three basic types. Of course, it was the tragedy, the comedy, and the pastoral. And apologies to all diabetics and dieters for the use of these graphics. We can imagine that tragedy is the bittersweet nature of chocolate. Comedy is the bright and light lemony flavors that we see in the middle tarts and cakes. And of course, pastoral plays will have the earthy and yet sweet, still sweet nature of strawberries. They expected plays to have a single theme and a single flavor. That is Aristotle and Sir Philip. But as De Vere knew, life isn't like that at all all. No matter how you slice it, life is a mixture of colors and flavors at the same time. 
Traditionalists like Sidney never liked how jumbled up some contemporary plays were. As you can see here, everything is kind of messed up in this slice of cake. No matter where you look in the slice, you can find tragedy and comedy in almost equal measure. As in this speech by Nurse, who discovers Juliet is dead, in Act 5, Scene 5 of Romeo and Juliet. Don't worry, she's not really dead. Oh, woe, oh, woeful, woeful, woeful day. Most lamentable day, most woeful day that ever, ever I did yet behold. Oh, day, oh, day, oh, day, oh, hateful day. Never was seen so black a day as this. Oh, woeful day, oh, woeful day. Nurse was not a professional actress, of course, in the play. So she was meant to play this up and make it a very, very comic scene, just before the tragedy. This happens also in Hamlet, or perhaps the most famous scene in any play, the graveyard scene. Actors have played it for its dark humor and bitterness. Let me see. Hamlet takes the skull. Alas, poor York. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne to me on his back a thousand times. And now how abhorred in my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed high, no, not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chap fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber, and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. The way I'd play it, when he says, to this favor she must come, he turns the skull towards the audience. With that in mind, let us look at the word comedy and how it's defined in the OED. At least the concise OED, 3rd edition, 1944, page 223. It's the only edition I've got, but comedy, noun. Stage play of light, amusing, and often satirical characters chiefly representing everyday life and with a happy ending. Branch of drama concerned with ordinary persons and employing familiar language Life or an incident in it regarded as a spectacle. Classification of ancient Greek comedy, the first farcical and largely political, the last corresponding to modern comedy, and the second transitional. Life or an incident in it regarded as a spectacle. This brings us to a little bit of history. There were two general types of plays performed in Italy in the 16th century, Commedia all'arte and Commedia erudita. According to Mick Klingvall on his website on the Commedia dell'arte, earlier Commedia dell'arte was called Commedia improviso, improvised comedy, comedy a la mascara, comedy in mask, Commedia a subgetto, comedy on a given subject, Commedia mercenaria, commercial comedy. Commedia braccia, comedy at the top of one's head. Commedia degli zani, commedia with zani, or simply commedia italiana. These were the low-class entertainment, the common entertainment. Commedia erudita, on the other hand, was the scholar's form of satiric theater and thought too sophisticated for the public, so it was performed for nobles exclusively. Note, performed for nobles exclusively. Therefore, an alternative reading of comedy would be to see it as meaning commedia erudita. The Art of English Poesy by George Putnam, published in 1598, or 89 rather, provides evidence that playwrights were also called poets. Here is what he said in Book 1, Chapter 13. 
the poets devise to have many parts played at once by two or three or four persons that debated matters of the world, sometimes of their own private affairs, sometimes of their neighbors, but never meddling with any prince's matters nor high, such high personages, but commonly of merchants, soldiers, artificers, good honest householders, and also of unthrifty youths, young damsels, old nurses, bods, brokers, ruffians, and parasites, with such like, in whose behavior lieth in effect the whole course and trade of man's life, and therefore tended altogether to the good amendment of man by discipline and example. It was also much for the solace and recreation of the common people by reason of the pageants and shows, and this kind of poem was called comedy. The writer later identifies poesy in more broad terms. Poesy is a skill to speak and write harmonically, from Book 2, Chapter 1. And the Art of English Poesy says that poets were not held in high esteem, from Book 1, Chapter 8. But in these days, although some learned princes take delight in them, poets, yet universally it is not so. For as well poets as poesry are despised, and the name become of honorable infamous, subject to scorn and derision, and rather reproach than a praise to any that useth it. For commonly who is so is studious in the art, or shows himself excellent in it, they call him in disdain a fantastical, and a light-headed or fantastical man, by conversion they call a poet. De Vere himself was called the Italian Englishman and probably called in disdain a fantastical, a light-headed or fantastical man behind his back or sometimes in front of him because he was known among his courtiers as being a poet. The writer goes on to say that nobles who were reluctant to publish under their own names now also of such among the nobility or gentry as be very well seen in many laudable sciences, and especially in making of poesy. It is so come to pass that they have no courage to write, and if they have, yet they are loath to be known of their skill. So, as I know very many notable gentlemen in the court that have written commendably and suppressed it again, or else suffered it to be published without their known names given to it, as if it were a discredit for a gentleman, so seem learned and to show himself amorous of any good art. In other ages it was not so, for read that kings and princes have written great volumes and published them under their own regal titles. This is proof and evidence that there was a stigma against print among the nobles. Of course, doubters to the post-Stratfordian theories would say, uh-uh, no, no, nah, it's not true. But this tells them they are wrong. So where does that leave to fear? Again, so as I know very many notable gentlemen in the court that have written commendably and suppressed it again, or else suffered it to be published without their own names given to it, as if it were a discredit for a gentleman, so seem learned, and to show himself amorous, which here means expert at, any good art, or at least liking to write it. Well, there's proof from Palatus Tamio that Mears knew De Vere was the man Shakespeare. This page, page 282b as I call it, because weirdly enough in this entire book, only the second page, or the recto, not the verso, is numbered. It's weird. But anyways, this page shows that he inserted more clues that identified De Vere as Shakespeare. And I'm just going to concentrate on the first paragraph. Actually, the first two. Let's put it this way. Okay, what I've done is I've attempted to recreate exactly what is on the facsimile or the scan of the, the book. So, first, how many words are there before Shakespeare? In other words, what 
number is Shakespeare. What is the gematria sum of the first three italic uppercase letters? What is the gematria sum of the first four Roman uppercase letters? That is, the Roman le uppercase letters from the beginning to the S in Shakespeare. What is the gematria sum of all uppercase letters up to and including Shakespeare? How many characters are in this line? Please excuse the fuzziness of this detail. It's the only thing I could find, but it shows that I got the spacing correct. Next, count the number of individual names from the first line to the second, Shakespeare. Names including towns or cities. Here are the solutions. All are multiples of 17. 17 times 1, times 2, times 3, and times 5. Now we've seen puzzles which identify Shakespeare with numbers associated with De Vere, we can reinterpret what this means, comedy. It refuted Sir Philip Sidney's antagonism against modern plays that mixed the Aristotelian unities, or abandoned them altogether. So in summary, the best for comedy amongst us is Edward De Earl of Oxford. We can say that Comedy did not have the same meaning as today. It could refer to the Commedia Eredita. Playwrights were known as poets. Poets were not held in high esteem, meaning that nobles were reluctant to publish under their own names. And Mears in Pallidus Tamia has given us the clues that De Vere and Shakespeare were one in the same person. In context, Mears was saying De Vere was the best for playwriting. Therefore, we can say this is more evidence that Edward De Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford, was Shakespeare. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.